That's Austin. He's a pretty good egg. <laughs> Gives me trouble a lot. Yeah. Just kind of, not bad trouble, but just harasses me a lot. Uh, the, there's an education brochure. It looks different than what we've used in the past. It's less information, but it's for Wednesday night and Sunday morning adult education. It's important to go to classes to be taught. Uh, and God commends people who study the Word. And, uh, you know, you may know principles and know the Word, but when you go back over it and you study again, as I started just today a, a class uh, on David, then it reminds me of those truths. And we always glean and share with each other and in community in a smaller setting. So I urge you, pick up uh, one of those. And then as you leave, if you haven't already picked up the Spring Quarterly magazine, there's an article about the placentias in here. Uh, Eduardo, I think, is up. Uh, is he doing the translation? And But anyway, where are you guys? Oh, you are over here. Stand up, placentias. There are articles in here about them and their journey and God's miracle practice provision. And then there's an article about one of our missionaries. There's information about different ministry and opportunities, a, a word from Pastor Jeff. So pick these up and keep them all quarter. This is the spring quarter. It projects events heading to the future as well. And there's, as you leave, you'll see racks with these in them. But be sure everyone gets one of these. It's a very important uh, piece of communication. Um, today I'm, I'm preaching on a message called Live Dead. Live Dead, uh, uh, there's a gentleman that's coming to our church for our missions convention, Dick Brogdon, who's a phenomenal speaker, and he started Live Dead. Uh, and Live Dead is basically wherever in the world that missionaries go to risk their lives to take the gospel. Jesus had 12 disciples, 11 of them died for bringing the gospel. And to live dead means I will go and I will risk to go to a people so that they can hear and give my life to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ. And my challenge to you today is that all of us be live dead missionaries. You see, somehow we have this idea that and we almost glorify man and we exalt these missionaries that will do such a thing. And we, we, we lift them up, you know. And, uh, and we think, well, that's, that's for them, that's their calling. But God has called all of us to take up our cross daily, to die to ourself and our will and live for God. The commission, the great commission is going to all the world and preach the gospel, teaching them to observe all things. And parents and grandparents, your first responsibility with the gospel is to your children and your grandchildren. It's your responsibility to lead your children to the Lord. And whatever you're passionate about, they'll believe that you believe in. If you're more passionate about the Baylor Bears or the Iowa Hawkeyes or Cyclones or the Panthers or about your job, about your vacations, about your hobbies, and you are about Jesus and the gospel, your kids will realize that that part of your life isn't as important to you. And when you die to all the things of this world and you die to yourself and your will to be in the center of God's will, then you're going to find that, like Jesus, when he said, I came to seek and to save the lost, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. And when our lives emulate that, we're dead so that Christ lives in us and that very being in him flows through us that we might have Christ speak through us with authority and power to impact the world around us, then I will tell you for certain, you will bring in the harvest. People will come to know Jesus Christ. But you know, kids that grow up in the church and they don't follow the Lord, uh, that's going to happen even if you do everything right because we all have an individual will and that child can decide. But let me challenge you. It's not just to bring children to the church as a parent and a grandparent. Oh, I always brought them to church. No. You lead them to Christ. You set them down. You're the first responsibility to teach them. Sunday school is a great mechanism, but it's a support to the family. And somehow we've abdicated the teaching the Bible to of our children to the church when God never intended it. It says to love the Lord, Deuteronomy 6, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, and, to, and to teach the statutes of the Lord to your children and to their children. 
That's our responsibility. So if we're too caught up with our lives, with our earthly life, with our food, with our entertainment, with our making a living, with everything that ends when you die, then we're going to miss giving to the next generation, and it's what's happened in the church, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and training them and putting the word. The Jews put us, to, the, 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 the devout Jews put us to shame in how they teach their kids, they memorize the word, they plant it in their heart, and how they raise up their children to be God-fearing people. And we need to rise up and take responsibility, people. So first, I'm going to challenge you to live dead. To live dead. Live with your earthly life not mattering. Paul said, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. He also said uh, that, uh, that, it's, that, that I live, nevertheless not I, but Christ lives in me. And what the problem is, is we have religion on the outward side, that which we do that is a struggle and an effort. But what we need is Jesus from the inside to flow out of us to the world. Jesus on the inside to change us by the power of his grace. As the songwriter said, the song from the inside out, your will above all else, my purpose remains. The art of losing myself and bringing you praise. The everlasting, everlasting, your light will shine, that we will be a light, that Jesus' light shines when all else fails. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all fame, that your glory be known, that my life brings you glory, God, and not my personal gain or fame. My heart and my soul, I give you control. Consume me, consume me, burn in me from the inside out. May he fill you up and burn in you on the inside to the out. And now you have God in you, Christ, the hope of glory, the spirit flowing from within you outward as opposed to trying to grab a hold of, of, of the railings, of the stairs, of being good enough and striving and walking and going toward God in your own effort from the outside. It's an inside job that Jesus only can do. Hey, raise your hand if you work in nursery, twos, threes, fours, anytime, Wednesday, Sunday, Sundays on a rotate. Raise your hand real high. Come on, let me see all around there. Can I say you personally thank you? I also serve in there uh, and from time to time, and I'm on the schedule once a month or whichever other month or something. I'm not even sure. I got to check with my wife, Susan. But uh, we're, we go in there, right? And I go in there extra times. I want to tell you, my grandchildren have benefited greatly. And I want to show you a clip of the most important verse. And by the way, this verse, John 3, 16, comes with the story of Jesus telling Nicodemus, you must be born again. And a spiritual birth that happens inside. And then Jesus exp explaining that God didn't send him into the world to condemn people. He didn't send to put some noose of religion and rules over across someone's neck. He came to give them life, to take condemnation away, to forgive. And this verse, John 3, 16, my daughter-in-law didn't teach it to them. My son didn't teach it. I'm not sure they didn't reinforce it. I don't know for certain, but I was told they were learning this in preschool. So you're making a difference. I want to thank you. Watch this video and turn it up plenty good. It's, part of it is a little bit uh, echoey, but I think you'll get the idea. God loves the world so much that he gave his only son. You know that, easily? Don't you guys mean that yourself?
So here's what you have to appreciate. The two-year-old are taught that Bible verse, God gave Jesus. So she knew it. She wasn't quite, well, let's see, she had just turned two. Sam wasn't quite four, and he's got the whole thing, and he's saying, like, so much. That's just the way the Word of God means. God loves the world so much. <laughs> and he's witnessing, telling, did you know that, to his little sister. Thank you for ministering to our early childhood. We appreciate you. Can we give everybody that does that? That's a, that's a real servant. Thank you. And just like when you're a parent and you have preschoolers, those are the hard years. It's, it is, it can be difficult, but it's so rewarding. And I would, or we always are needing help. So if you, if you can help, that'd be awesome. So I got back from Israel. And uh, what just happened over here, we saw the Jordan River. Uh, we saw where Joshua opened up the Jordan River. The Israelites walked into the promised land across on dry ground. And uh, we saw so many places. It's like every place we went, the, you read the Bible and there's the place. We saw one place where there was a, a, a tell, which the word T-E-L is a place, it's called, it's a hill. And they built their villages or their towns on tops of hills because there was an issue with water and food and all of that. And so every, the towns had to be protected. And up high, where the enemy has to go up at you, is where they always built it to protect themselves. And so J J Jacob, the Bible records, went there with the Israel, army of God. And he split them into two camps or two c companies took his warriors, his, his army, the army of Israel, and put one on the Tel Penuel, a one, and we stood there and we watched it, okay? It would probably be maybe from here to the, uh, to the student campus in one direction, and then from here to the student campus in the other direction is Menachem, another Tel, and the Bible talks about this, and this is where Jacob, and then it says the Jabbok River, the ford of the, this is where Jacob rested the angel of the Lord, where the ford of the Jabbok River came together. So you got the river coming on this side, and the river coming from this side, and where they gather and where they meet is the ford, and it's exactly what the Bible says. It's described exactly, and every place you go, from place to place to place, and every story in the Bible that names a town, names a place, they know where almost all of those are, but some of them, maybe they haven't found all of them in excavation and archaeological finds, but the Bible is real. You don't need faith to believe the Bible is true and real. The stories in it are real. I've walked in the brook where David got his stones that killed Goliath. I've stood where, uh, right where Jesus was born in Bethlehem. It's marked through the ancients. It's been marked. Right where he was crucified. I've been right there, right by it. And right where he was buried, it's plain and it's clear. It's there. It's documented outside of the Bible. This book is real. Faith applies what we know with fact that is true, decides that I'm going to submit myself to the God of Israel, the truth of this God who has put this book down and gave his son and I'm going to tell you right now, if you haven't given your life to Jesus, I hope you cry out to him today and say, here's my life fully. I want to live for him. And I want to be baptized in the waters of repentance, the baptism of Jesus and repentance of John. Here's, here's uh, chapter 6 says about what happened over here. Uh, well then, because he's talking about amazing grace. Should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? This is Romans 6. Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ in baptism. That's the picture of going under the water that we believe he 
died and rose again. He was buried and rose again. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives, raised to live a new life. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Verse 5, since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was raised to life. We know that our old sinful, our, our, our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our life. See, we're saved from sin, not, not saved to wash sin so we go to heaven. No, he doesn't want you to live weak and sinful. He's called us to be a peculiar, holy people. So, so Christ says, so, so we were crucified with Christ so that sin may lose its power in our life. We're no longer slaves to sin. We can't say the devil made me do it. We're no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. We live with him. And so it goes on. It talks more and more and makes that very plain. Now, take your Bibles, if you have them, to John chapter 4, if you will. John chapter 4. Show some pictures of Israel. This wall on the screen is a wall uh, at, uh, up on the, um, uh, Mount Gerizim. It's a, a place, it's actually just down, uh, just a little bit down toward the valley from there, but it's an uh, it's, it's a old site of the Samaritans uh, and where they worship God. They built a temple there. <clears throat> and in that temple, the Samaritans were, when the Babylonians took captivity, some of the Israelites stayed up in the north country here, and the Samaritans were Jews that had stayed behind and didn't leave Israel in the captivity, and then they ended up marrying uh, others that weren't Jews and weren't of the God of Israel faith, the, the faith of, of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they married heathens that had false gods, and they brought within their temple, they brought other gods. And so they had a mixture, and you could see the signs of that in the archaeology. Uh, <clears throat> and so the, this wall in at this place dates back to... Um, uh, it's, it's ancient, ancient uh, uh, Shechem here, and it dates back to uh, uh, 4,000 years ago, Abraham. And this altar, keep going to the next picture. There's another wall, same thing, it's really old. Go ahead, next one. This is an altar that either Abraham or Joshua built, one of the two. They're not positive. But this is the temple. And see, for the Samaritans, they believed that, that the true place of worship was Mount Gerizim, here, okay? Mount Gerizim, not, not the, uh, the Mount, uh, Holy Mount, Temple Mount, not, not the place in Jerusalem, but here, right? And so this has to do, did Abraham offer up J uh, Isaac here, his son, to die at the altar? Did he offer him up, up on Mount Gerizim? Or was it like the Jews said in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount, a holy place? Where's the holy place? So we went to, uh, to meet with Samaritans. There are 811 living Samaritans, 811. A couple of hundred of them live in the Tel Aviv area. The rest of them live up in this region of Samaria where we were. And we had a speech by the guy next in line. His father, our grandfather, is the high priest for them. And we got a speech by this guy who is explaining that this is the holy place in Jerusalem, is it? They still are saying the same thing in John chapter 4. Now, I'm reading from the NLT, which Dr. Nunley says is a very good translation, the best being NASB, the New American Standard Bible, because it's the truest to the Hebrew. But the NLT here, I'm reading from it, and it adds a couple of things that are very pertinent, that are accurate uh, uh, in the story, namely that your version might say we're supposed to worship on this mount or in Jerusalem. That's what the woman asked. And it adds Mount Gerizim. Also, there's another picture, keep going. Jacob's well. This is Jacob's well that he built. Remember I told you uh, we saw where Jacob wrestled the angel of the Lord there where the, the Jabbok River Ford comes together and you got Penuel and Menachem. That's where the angel, that's where Jacob 
at Wrestle. That was a mighty time. And next picture is the same thing. This has got a church built over it, but this would have been just out in the wilderness, just outside the city of Sychar, outside Shechem, right there in the valley between the two mountains, one being the mountain of blessing, uh, which is uh, the Mount Gerizim, and the mountain of cursing, Mount a Abal, which you can go to another slide, maybe see what's there. There's the, another picture of uh, Jacob's well. This is actually as well. It's very deep, and people drink out of the water. It's still there. Okay, this is not if it's the place. It is the place, and they mark it with churches. They mark holy places with churches, so they've built the church over it. Go to the next slide. I'm not sure if there is the next one. Yeah, right here. So down in that valley uh, that's between the two mountains there, you can see the mountain of blessing and the mountain of cursing, Gerizim and Abal. All right, picking up in John 4, the first thing I want to say, in verse, starting in verse 1 of John 4, is that we must live dead, just like our, some of our missionaries do. We must live dead as followers of Jesus. Like, uh, like Luke says, that we're to take up our cross daily, every day, and follow Jesus. Die to yourself, your will. Like Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Okay? And we must live dead so that the gospel can go to everyone, everyone. Because you see, we are just as responsible as our missionaries to give the gospel wherever we are and to be passionate about it. It's God's, it's God's message to every one of us that that's what we live for. Okay, and Jesus starts in chapter 4, verse 1. Jesus knew the Pharisees, had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John, though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee, and he had to go through Samaria on the way. And so some will say, well, Jesus wouldn't have gone. Why was he going through Samaria? Because the Samaritans were false, and the Samaritans were looked down on by Jews and so forth. Why would he go through there? Because that's the path you go through. You don't go up over a mountain, and if you went around, like some suggest, it takes another day or more just to get there. So people all the time were cutting through Samaria. It was common. They didn't skirt it. Eventually, he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field, right here, near the field Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. There it is. We saw a picture. Those of you that were there, now all of a sudden when you read this, I was told at the early service, you just see it like you're there. It becomes a living color, right? His well was there. And Jesus, tired from a long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. The way I was weary when I walked up this 50-mile hill, mountain, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but it's how it felt. And if it wasn't for Todd Hart's for her helping me get down, I'd have still been up there. But anyway, it took me an hour and a half to walk up, and that's where Moses' brother Aaron is buried, right? And we sat there and looked at that right near, uh, near uh, Petra, right? They go through Petra and up the mountain. It was way up there. And Jacob was there, and Jesus was tired, and, and, and he was weary. He's by the well about noon, so it was hot. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? And Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you're speaking to, you would have asked me and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where, do you, where would you get this living water? Besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons uh, and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again, meaning the water of Jacob's well. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within. See, it's the inside, within. See that? A bubbly, fresh, like a spring within them, giving them eternal life. She said, please, sir, the woman said, give me this water, then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Well, she didn't quite understand, but there was something convincing about Jesus. And I want you to see in this that the gospel, that we have to live dead because the gospel is for everyone. See, we all kind of bring prejudices in. You can see that, that this woman way back in Jesus is dealing with the same thing that the next priest or the Samaritans now talking about and arguing, is this the holy mountain Gerizim or is it the one, the mountain, temple mount in Jerusalem? 
They were back then, this woman, that's what that's about. She's saying, you know, where do we worship? She, she's sitting there, and so she hadn't, she hadn't brought that up yet. But, the, but Jesus has given, Jesus has given them water, and she points out, why are you talking to me? I'm a woman. Later we'll see that very clear as we continue to read. And I want you to know that the gospel's for everyone, the whole world. God so loved the whole world, the world, the world that he gave his only begotten son. That means every person, every language, and every tongue, every person, no matter how poor, it doesn't matter what they look like on the outside. It's everyone, and everyone, you know, we have our prejudices, and, 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 we, and we sometimes don't realize how much Jesus loves every person. It doesn't matter about your money or your age or anything. It ma- every person needs it. And guys, listen, there are so few people that are really have the bubbling spring of life, that water in them, so that it bubbles out on others. There's so few people out in the, the, the thirsty, dry land of this world that are empty that we have to have the fullness of Jesus. We have to be dead so Christ can live. We have to be dead so his spirit is strong and his word is alive because the world is depending on us to hear and God has asked us to be his witness witness and if we won't live dead and if we just want to feel good about ourselves and throw a little missions dollars toward live dead missionaries then we're not doing what God has asked us to do Jesus wants you to win souls and they'll you know let me ask you something how many of you have won a soul in the last week or month or year or 10 years if you're not there's something wrong there's something wrong you should be fishing fishing and fishing for souls and reaching Jesus came to seek and save the lost, and that's, what he, that's his heart he puts in us. We've got to be about it and not be afraid. It's for everyone, this gospel. We have to live dead so that none of our prejudices stop us from going after every living being, no matter who they are, sick, no matter who they are. With leprosy, you see it in the life of Jesus, it didn't matter. He went after every person he met. And the second thing, if we don't live dead, Christ can't live. Because if we're alive... He can't live. See? And so we keep reading, and you'll see it really clear with Jesus, that he had died to himself and was alive to his father and was doing the purpose and the will of his father. And so it says, Jesus said in verse 16, picking up the story, go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband. For you've had five husbands and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth, she said. No, 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 Jesus said, you certainly spoke the truth that you don't have a husband. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. I thought, brilliant. She figured out he was a prophet, right? Uh, I find that kind of humorous, actually. Verse 20, so tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it is here on Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worshiped? There it is. Jesus is dealing with the same thing they're doing right now. The Samaritans are still arguing that Gerizim is the holy mountain. Still today, we were there. We heard it, didn't we? Shake your head if you was with me. You heard them talking about it. They were telling us how the Jews are wrong. It's not Temple Temple Mount. It's not in Jerusalem. Here's the holy mountain, Gerizim, the Samaritan land. It was going on then. So Jesus got in an argument with her and began to argue why Jerusalem was the correct place and not Gerizim. Wait, no, Scripture didn't say that. What did he do? Uh, Jesus replied, verse 21, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. The time is coming, and it doesn't matter that Jesus is going to come, whether it's pre-trib, mid-trib, or late-trib. Forget it. Quit arguing and get on. Doctrine doesn't save anybody. Jesus does. It's what you do with Jesus. You can be theologically right and be busting hell wide open. You can be theologically wrong and enter into heaven well done thou good and faithful servant because you did the right thing with jesus because the last i read your theology doesn't save you jesus saves you does that mean theology is not important i'm not saying that i believe it's important but i believe first when you get jesus in there his spirit comes to live and the bible says the spirit illuminates the word and the word becomes alive and he leads you into all truth so jesus wasn't about arguing about with this woman this this age-old argument of where the holy mountain is he just said uh, it won't matter 
whether you worship on this mountain here or Jerusalem. You Samaritans knew very, and then he really says it right to her, you Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while Jews know all about him, for salvation comes to the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed, it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. The Father's looking for those who will worship him that way, for God is a spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And let me just pause to say, spirit, truth is that you live the truth, not you believe the truth. You worship by living the truth, by following Jesus who said, I am the way, the life, the truth, his way and not what you think. And there are a lot of people that by their passion or whatever they think, they feel like this, they, I feel this way, I just don't think that's right, I feel that way, and the devil has tricked them, they've made them feel wrong, they've gotten wrong desires, because they have desires deep within them that are sinful desires, doesn't make it righteous, and it doesn't make it that God, uh, God uh, put his stamp of approval on that. In fact, what Jesus does when he comes into your heart by his grace is change your desire. That's what saving does. It does, he saves you from sin and the desire for sin. He doesn't just erase so you can keep sinning, just have a big eraser, sin, sin, race, 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 race. Go on sinning so grace can amount. Sin, sin, race, erase, erase. No, he saves you from the desire to live what the Bible says is sinful. He sets you free from it. He gives you a different desire. When I was a young teenager, I desired girls wrong, right? It's wrong. My timing was off. So I'm just telling you that God changes your desire and he gives you power to live out in obedience to his word. So you worship him in spirit and truth. And spirit is like, you know, with passion. If you're not passionate about it, no one's going to believe you. Are you more passionate about Jesus? Are the Hawkeyes, they already say this. Oh, that, I thought I said it in early service. I already said it in here too. Maybe you need to hear it again. Cyclones by Baylor Bears, right? No, passion. You know, uh, did I mention Kim Mulkey? Yeah, she's coach of Baylor Lady Bears. You're talking about passion. She says, if you don't believe in something, why are you doing it? And I'm telling you, the reason people don't follow God is because we don't really believe it because we live half-hearted and apathetic because it's not our passion. It's not consuming. It's not a burning fire for God. Can I just say something? Churches that don't have Sunday night church, it's because that church is backslidden. Because when the awakening in America happened, people couldn't get enough church just Sunday morning. They wanted more of God. And the problem is, is that we feel like that's a noose around our neck because we don't have a desire to want more of God. And sometimes you can't be here because there's physical reasons, work, and other things, responsibilities. I get that. But most of the time, it's just because we're lazy and we want to live our earthly life and we don't want to, to, to use the energy to get here and seek God and worship God and go after God, pursue God. You don't like that, do you? The woman said in verse 25, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who's called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. He goes, okay, you're not going to talk about it. We'll just wait till the Messiah comes. He'll tell us where the true mountain to worship is. In verse 26, Jesus said, I'm the Messiah. He told her, I'm the Messiah. Just then his disciples came back, and they were shocked to find him talking to a woman. See that? Because he shouldn't have been talking to a woman. But the gospel's too important not to talk to a woman. Women are valued. You see, it's culture that has devalued women in other races. It's not God. You hear me? Not God. In fact, Jesus Turn that around, and Paul said, in the kingdom of God, there's no male nor female, no slave nor free, and there's no Greek or Jew. We are all children of God. But none of them had the nerve to ask. They were afraid to ask Jesus, what are you doing talking to a woman, Jesus? You know you're not supposed to be doing that. They didn't have the nerve to ask. He says, what do you want with her? He said, or why are you talking to her? Verse 28, 28, the woman left her water beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. She became an instant testimony of what Jesus had done and called her out. Now I want to tell you something. If you don't die, Christ can't live. You see, Jesus used the, a word of knowledge. Jesus had the spirit in him. Jesus was able to see through. Jesus was able to talk to her. And Jesus' life was full of spirit. And so it brought conviction. And she recognized him and went to tell what had happened and became a, telling the story of it, about it. 
And let me tell you something. If, if, we, if we don't die, we can't have the Spirit of God to quicken us and lead us as we share and remember, remind us of Scripture and help us be full of wisdom, how each person is different, how to talk to them about Christ and how to pray what is God's plan so you can win people to Christ because you all are different. You have differing gifts. It could be a dinner club you could use to invite the lost. It could be a sports club. It could be a bicycle club. It could be anything. It could be any, anything that you put together where you bring up a Christian or two, and then you bring a few that don't know them, and you put them together, and you ride bikes together. You cook together. You, uh, you're interested in playing bridge, which I don't understand. I think it's uh, beyond my intellectual abilities and doesn't interest me although I got to be careful because my 89 year old mother used to play that and she's pretty smart so I don't want to insult the bridge players uh, so forgive me but whatever it is you you get a plan you ask God if you care you say God give me a plan I can win somebody how do I do this how do I influence them to let them see that Jesus the Messiah is the real deal and worth following you can do it you know, our getting together with people that are lost is just to be kind as Christians. That's not enough. We have to be intentional. Intentional. Okay? So we, if we don't live dead and Christ isn't living, we're not going to win the loss. We have to live dead that Christ might live so that we can win the loss. And the last one is spreading the gospel. John 4, starting to verse 31. We pick up there at the story. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging, oh boy, I'm going along. Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. Did someone bring you food while we were gone? The disciples asked each other, did they bring him some food? Then Jesus explained, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. You know the saying, Jesus said, four months between planting and harvest. But I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages. And the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike? You know the saying, one plants another harvest, and it's true. I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant, and others have already done the work now, and now you will get to gather the harvest. Verse 39, many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. And when they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe not just because of what you told us, woman, but because we've heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the Savior of the world. And here's what I want to leave you with. If you live dead for the spread, you live dead for the spread of the gospel. You see, Jesus wasn't interested in just his belly, which represents the flesh life, the temporary life. He was spiritually alive. And he didn't need food anymore, man. It charged him up. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. The sheaves representing lost souls. Talking about the harvest. Bringing in the harvest. And I'm going to tell you, boy, when you, when you share with Jesus and people come to really know him and become alive in him and the bubbly springs of living life on the inside flow out, there's nothing more joyous. All of a sudden, you're not interested in the lunch that's about to happen here pretty quick. Your focus is on the things of God, and you're, you're captivated. But see, too many times we're not dead, so the gospel cannot spread. If we want the gospel to spread, we got to live dead. If you want the gospel to spread, you got to live dead. you got to be more about the eternal kingdom of God and people coming to Christ than you are about your temporary life and making a living and eating your food and, and enjoying your life. And I'm sorry, but most of you are pretty pathetic at it. You don't like that, do you? Well, I'm not much better, but I got a plan, and I'm going to carry it out, and I hope you'll get a plan and get convicted. Start with your kids and your grandkids, then your neighbors, coworkers, and let's get this gospel going, okay? Some of you can sell anything, Amway, you name it, you can sell anything. Well, let's get to selling Jesus, right? He's the best thing on earth, best thing in the world, best thing anywhere. He's got the best product ever. His life and abundant life and eternal life. And he's the lover of our soul and he's a merciful God. So let's get together and let's make this happen. Will you bow your head with me? You're here and you need Jesus to forgive your sin and like come on the inside. 
you find yourself struggling trying to act like a Christian, but you just don't have that inside witness and the life of God inside you, and you, know, you want Jesus to just fill you up. Would every head bow and every eye close for respect of your neighbor? Just close your eyes, if you would, everyone. And I'm going to ask right now, if you're here and you need to know for sure that you're going to go to heaven when you die, and you say, Jesus, come on the inside. I want that living water, that bubbly water of life that I would never thirst. Would you just lift your hand? Anyone here say, Jesus, come in the real way, the bubbly life of eternal life. Come inside me. Would you lift your hand? Come on. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Anyone else? I'm looking to my right. Yes, ma'am, in the back. God loves you. Yes, sir. Young man, God loves you. He loves you. Yes, sir. He sees your hand. He loves you so much. Yes, I see your hand. I see your hand. And over here, I see your hand. And how many of you say, I, I want to be a carrier of the passion and the fire of God, of the gospel of Jesus, the good news? I want to say, God, so, God loved the world, loves the world so much that he gave his son, Jesus. Do you know that? I want to... I want to start winning souls. Rich, raise your hand up and say, I'm going to do everything I can. I'm going to do everything I can. I've got to compel them to come in as Jesus taught that my house before. I've got to share this gospel. I need the power of your spirit to help me, to guide me. I need your strength to be a witness and to win the loss at all costs. That I die so that Christ might gain and might live. Take up my cross, not my will. The food Jesus said he had was to do the will of the Father. That fueled him. And seeing this Samaritan woman, sinful woman, be forgiven and receive eternal life.